Good morning. No, I'm going to throw everybody out. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Anyway, uh, today is November 26. I want to welcome everyone to uh, this morning's HCED uh, committee hearing. And I want to uh, wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. I'm joined today by my colleague from the 9th District, Jan Perry. Uh, Mr. Uh, City Attorney, even though we do not have a quorum, uh, I, I want to proceed. So what we will do is any actions that we take now will be communiques from the chair. And then when I get another uh, member, we'll, uh, we will roll it at that point in time. We have several items, 13 items today, 11 of which are on the consent calendar. Uh, I know I have some public comment cards. I think what I want to do is handle the uh, consent calendar first. So with that said, uh, Mr. Uh, CLA, would you read item one? Uh, item number one is a community re redevelopment agency request and CLA report to, uh, relative to expending $4 million from the land acquisition fund for partial, parcels located on the 8400 and 8500 blocks of South Vermont Avenue. Okay, then uh, as a communique of the chair, we will uh, adopt the CLA report. You know, you don't look like me, Miss no Barclay. But I will Ivanya, what's up? Where's Ivanya? What's up with this? <laughs> anyway, Mr. Uh, CLA, read item two, please. Item number two, CRA report and CLA to report relative to a MOU with the Environmental Simulation Center acceptance of a 375,000 grant to initiate the pilot human development overlay project and related contract and other actions. Okay, on item two, uh, as a communique from the chair, we'll adopt the CLA report. That brings us to item three. CRA request and CLA uh, report relative to resolution, relative to amending the redevelopment plan for the Watts Recovery Redevelopment Project area to expand the project boundary, reinstate amended domain powers, confirm permitted lang land use language, and provide flexibility in the redevelopment plan land use map. Okay, then we'll adopt the CLA report again as a communique from the chair. That brings us to item four. Item four, CRA report and CAO report relative to a grant agreement with the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Center and the amount of 325000 to assist with its supportive services and administrative operations. Okay, we'll adopt that again as a communique from the chair. Adopt the CLA report, item five. Item five is CRA and CAO report relative to awarding contracts in a total amount of not to exceed $4.5 for a three-year period with two one-year extension to 10 firms for general landscaping services. Okay, item five, uh, we'll adopt the CAO report as a communique from the chair. That brings us to item six. Uh, item six is a CRA report and CLA report relative to a contract in the amount of 150,000 with Main Street Canoga Park for the continued operation and expansion of the Canoga Park Main Street program and enhanced landscaping and maintenance services. Okay, item six, we'll adopt the CLA report. Uh, as a communique from the chair, that brings us to item seven. Uh, item number seven is a CRA request and CLA report on file relative to amending the contract with Chrysalis Works in the amount of not to exceed 50,000 for the term of exceed, to exceed one year, uh, not to exceed one year for the purpose of providing continued landscaping services. Okay, then on item seven, we'll adopt the CLA report as a communique from the chair. That brings us to item eight. A CDD report and CAO report on file relative to an amendment with J.H. Schneider, J.H. Schneider Company for a, uh, total of 25 million in funding to assist in the development of the 959 uh, Seward office campus and related actions. Okay, well, item eight, we'll adopt, as, uh, we'll adopt the CAO report as a uh, communique from the chair, item nine. Uh, CDD report and CAO report on file relative to an, uh, another agreement with J. Schneider uh, to provide 13.9 million funding assistance in the development of the NoHo three office building project and related actions. Mr. Schneider's really busy, what, yeah. what do you think? He's busy today. Popular. He's really busy. Item nine, busy. we will uh, adopt the CAO report as a communique from the chair. That brings us to, okay, we're going we're gonna to stop. We've just been joined by El Presidente, which means we have a quorum. So, uh, Mr. President, we've just done items one through nine as a communique from the chair. What I'd like to do, since you're here, is we, he, he concurs in those items. So uh, items one through nine, uh, well, you know, we'll uh, proceed uh, okay. without objection. We'll deem all of those approved. Item 10. Item number 10 is the Los Angeles Housing Department uh, report and CAO report relative to a request for proposals for hiring a consultant 
for the design development of a rent stabilization and code enforcement outreach program. There's also a technical amendment okay, uh, to so that. Then what we'll do on item 10, we'll adopt the CAO report with the uh, technical amendment. That brings us to item 11. Item number 11 is a motion Garcetti rule relative to rem uh, remedying financial gaps in the amounts of $718,552 for the Mediterranean affordable housing development and 30, uh, 390000 for the Hollywood bungalow apartments project. Okay, Mr. City Clerk. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, since we have uh, a new representative from the CLA's office, and a new representative from the city attorney's office. Uh, let, let's make sure they understand the rule of this committee. So who, whose motion is this? This would be the council president's motion, sir. And is he a member of this committee? Yes, sir, he is. So what is your recommendation that uh, I do with this motion? I would uh, recommend that you uh, approve it forthwith. Now, is that crystal clear? Crystal clear. Crystal clear. So on item 11, we'll adopt the motion. Thanks, sir. Council member, pardon the interruption. Uh, item 11 is also scheduled in council later th uh, this morning. Oh, okay. That then bring. okay, now what I want to do is uh, I've got uh, one public comment card, and that's Mr. Chuck Tennant. Chuck, good morning. Good morning. No, I, I didn't get yours yet. I, Alan, I told him not to give me any public comment cards from you. So know you're next. Do something different today. Happy Thanksgiving. Morning, Chuck. Good morning. Martin Luther King had a dream. He shared it with everyone that wanted to share it with him. And look what one man's vision of years ago did. His dream is and has become a reality and continues to grow and is changing history. This city has a dream to be a better place for everyone end violence, affordable housing, and money to spend. Janice Hahn has a dream to help kids stop violence and fund youth programs. A song, Stop the Violence, We Can All Live in Peace, is a powerful tool that everyone in this city can use. It's beyond expectations. It's so good, the youth choir can sing it at Obama's inauguration in January. Obama himself said, we need to give our kids an opportunity. This unique and special song is once in a lifetime. We need to make this happen. Stop the Violence was inspired by many people, was created in Watts in this city of Los Angeles. It was inspired by many people, including Councilman Herb Weston Jr., whose love for kids and in helping kids and in stopping the violence in this city is a dream of his. I hope that everyone will share the Councilwoman's dream of this song project that will be used to fund youth programs and to stop the violence. I asked Herb if he would sing with the kids, and he said, gee, I don't sing, but count me in. And I told Herb that he doesn't have to be a good singer. Anyone can sing it, including kids, and we're all kids. I hope that when this song is unveiled and it's almost ready, and it is so incredible that it's gonna be shared with cities all over the U.S., and I hope everyone in this council joins Janice Hahn in singing with the kids and in supporting this project to fund youth programs to help the kids and stop the violence in her district and in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It's got to have a soulful beat, though, if you want me to participate. It's <laughs> incredible. We, we've just been joined by another member of this committee, uh, Councilman Tony Cardness. With that, no good morning. Good morning, Herb, and you know, you're more than welcome to provide that soulful beat. Uh, and Mr. Garcetti, in terms of the accompaniment, he can provide that too. Um, Herb and committee members, I wanted again to reiterate the continuing proposal here to have somebody from the housing department uh, and also, Herb, have a regular agenda item that basically has the housing department here to listen to complaints from the public relative to specific situations or have the housing department on a proactive basis tell this committee, tell the public what problems they found and how they've solved those problems. I think that's, again, I want to kind of renew that recommendation. Hopefully at some point it will find uh, acceptance. Um, secondly, with regard to the, uh, uh, this, this foreclosure issue, I, I don't quite understand why it would take uh, two weeks for the city attorney to basically add one sentence to the current RSO, because all we're talking about is exempting 
buildings that are currently in foreclosure from the uh, RSO provisions, and that's just one <laughs> or two sentences maximum. And, and I'm just and I'm concerned about also her the idea and committee members the idea of lowering these tenant relocation fees. Now I know that's going to come up on the second, and maybe there's a little bit of a uh, you know give and take here relative to saying, well, we're going to have we're going to give the tenants, and then we're going to take away on on the second of December. I really want to put in a push for holding this um, because. Honestly, it's going to create, I think, a differentiation between different categories of tenants. What you're doing here, you already have a differentiation, as we know, as we've had occasion to discuss, but now we're creating a new one. And I don't know that there's necessarily a factual basis for it, and my real concern is that we're going to basically undercut what we have worked hard to accomplish because somebody somewhere is going to bring a lawsuit, and part of the problem with this city is we have too much government by litigation in terms of saying, well, you're treating one category of tenants differently than another, and there's no rational basis for it, and therefore, um, it, somehow or other, we're going to end up on the lower end of the scheme. So I just want to really put forth <laughs> from the heart a request. They, and there are other ways to do this. There are other ways to give these, I, I, it's not that I'm, that there are other ways to solve the problem relative to subsidizing that differential. So okay. I'm, thank you for Thank listening. you, Noel. Okay, uh, Mr. CLA, that brings us to item 12. Item number 12 is a CRA report and CO report relative to amending the agency's fiscal year 2008-2009 CRA budget for additional carryover resources in the amount of $82 million and related actions. Okay, come forward, please. I got you. Good morning. Good morning. You doing this one alone? I don't see the budget. Oh. We don't get CLA reports. Lisa Johnson Smith, City Administrative Officer. Um, before you is a request by the agency to for various authorizations to amend its 2008-09 budget to recognize $82 million in care bureau resources from the prior fiscal year, tax increment and projected bond tax, projected tax allocation bond proceeds for central industrial and city center project areas, $1.5 million in Proposition 1C infrastructure, infill infrastructure grant funds for the Figueroa Corridor infrastructure improvements, Transfer $8.6 million to the development opportunity from three line items in the Reseda Canoga Park project area. A request for $424,000 in general revenue fund for labor and overhead expenses for the Central Business District. The, in terms of the land acquisition fund, to date the agency states that the total budget was $43.5 million, with council approved allocations totaling $24.6 million. Um, during the adopted budget for 2008-09, there was a request to put $1 million for a repayment by, city center in, by Central Industrial towards the General Revenue Fund, the agency's General Revenue Fund. And these funds were going to be dedicated to the Land Acquisition Fund. On November 7, 2008, the Council adopted a motion and amended the budget to delete that million dollars. As a result of that motion, the Land Acquisition Fund budget total is now $42.5 million. Um, deducting the $24.6 million of allocation, it leaves a balance of $17.9 million. And contained in the agency's report is to use that $17.9 million of funds uh, for expenditures that would include the South LA Plan Merger, Wilmington Plan Amendment, and eight projects subject to the review and approval of each project at a later date by the agency board and council. Our office recommends that two of those items, the South Los Angeles plan merger and the Wilmington plan amendment cost be removed from the $17.9 billion list based on the fact of the agency or the acquisition agency fund guidelines. These costs for these two plan studies are not eligible expenditures. So as a result of the removal of the two items that are Mr. not Chair eligible Mr. expenditures. Mr. Chairman, yes, I'm sorry. Can you point out uh, where in the report those two items are, what they're labeled or numbered or what have you. Okay. I want to make sure I'm following your recommendation. We, dis we discussed this on page four. On page four in the first paragraph, the first row paragraph, or, uh, it's, um, there's a $17.9 million request for money by the agency from the Land Acquisition Fund. Um, there's $900,000 that was requested for the South LA plan merger. 
that's in the South LA region, and there's $485,000 that was requested for the Wilmington Plan Amendment that's located in the LA Harbor re region. These co this money totals $1.385 million, and the costs are for analysis and potential implementation costs of these two plans. Um, we do have, um, the agency does have guidelines for how this money is supposed to be used from the fund. Um, they were submitted by the agency on July 10th, 2007, and amended by the council on August 1st, 2007. Um, the, the guidelines are the attachment, attachment seven. Uh, and one of the amendments that was made in the, uh, by the council was that these expenses should be for voluntary land acquisitions, and they're very costs that should be included in those expenses. And so the plan, emer uh, plan costs, the cost studies for the plan amendments are not eligible for these particular uh, acquisition fund monies. So therefore, our office recommends that those monies, a total of $1.4 million, be deleted from the $17.9 million in requested expenditures by the agency. That would reduce the requested amount to $16.5 million. Uh, we further recommend that the council instruct the agency relative to the acquisition funds to continue to prioritize the review and funding of the eight projects listed in the report with the final funding recommendation subject to the review of the land acquisition fund task force and approval by agency board and council. The agency stated that they had requested um, these monies from the land acquisition fund um, because of limited resources in the regions in these project er for these project areas. Uh, and they provided the AB 1290 budget, Assembly Bill 1290 budget, showing how much funds are available based on plan expenditures and proposed uses. Uh, and they only have a total of $604,000 available. So even if they were to use those monies, there'd still be a shortfall of $780,000 uh, in order to pay for these costs. In addition, the Central Industrial and City Center, uh, the, these work plans and project areas were adopted by the council in 2002. Um, they've been in litigation since then, and only recently in 2008 were these lawsuits resolved. Uh, due to the litigation of these project areas, the county had impounded all the tax increment from these project areas. And since the resolution happened earlier this year, uh, the county has started releasing these tax increments, and the agency has receded their received the impounded tax increment revenues, i.e. litigation settlement proceeds, and they've incorporated into their budget. And so as a request through this carryover is to incorporate those funds into the 2008-09 amended budget. In addition to the litigation proceeds, the agency plans to issue $15 million in net proceeds of tax allocation bonds, $7.5 million for each project area. Since 2002, the agency says the Central Industrial had borrowed $1.3 million from the agency's general revenue fund, and City Center had borrowed $4.8 million from the agency's general revenue fund, which is comprised of Bunker Hill, program income, and CRA special revenue. Um, the carryover amendment includes the repayment of a total of $3.3 million of those funds, uh, so that would be the entire $1.3 million from Central Industrial and $2 million from City Center, leaving City Center owing a balance of $2.8 million. Earlier, when we were approving the adopted budget, um, there was a request by the agency to use a $1 million from settlement proceeds. Um, the motion on November 7th deleted that request to put that $1 million of settlement proceeds back with the work program of Central Industrial. This budget was released prior to that motion um, going to council, so this budget contains, this carryover amendment contains the, three point, the full $3.3 .3 million. However, that million dollars has been deleted out of the $17.9 million request that's currently on the table. So therefore, in the, during the course of this preparation, we were advised that CD9 prefers that the full $3.3 .3 million uh, repayment to the agency general revenue fund not be made at this time, that CD9 has requested that the loan repayment, regardless of the funding source, whether settlement proceeds or bond proceeds, be postponed for at least three years, and that all funds be dedicated to the work program to help with the rehabilitation of single residential occupancy hotels. Therefore, we 
it's a policy decision as to whether the council would like to uh, have the repayment made uh, during this carryover or not have the repayment made at this time and postpone that decision. Uh, the impact of not making the repayment is that the $3.3 million will be deducted from the agency's general revenue fund. And since the agency was going to dedicate that money to the land acquisition fund, it would be, ded it would be deducted from the land acquisition fund total budget. Currently, the agency says their land acquisition ton total budget is $43.5 million, which includes the $3.3 million. By deducting the $3.3 million, it, their budget drops down to $40.2 million. Based on current allocations and the $16.5 million of expenditures proposed in this report, by removing the $3 million loan allocation, you have a funding shortfall of $915,000 should all the priority projects as detailed in our report result in being funded this year, fiscal year. So therefore, our, if you were to de delete the $3.3 million, you would adopt recommendation number two. And if you were to include the $3.3 million, you would adopt recommendation number one, A and B and then all the other uh, recommendations of the report. If I may, oh, can, no, I, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. can I just elaborate yes. and answer and Councilmember uh, Member Cardenas' question as well? Um, I'm Elsie Lai, Budget Manager at the CRA. Uh, the reason why we funded, and Attachment 7 in the CA, CLA CAO report details all of the allocations that were made from the Land Acquisition Fund in the carryover memo. Um, the reason why we included both the South LA plan merger and the Wilmington plan amendment as part of the Land Acquisition Fund allocation was because it has been agency policy since the creation of the Land Acquisition Fund to pool all general revenue resources in one place. So we could have taken off the top and, and pooled our general revenue together and made direct allocations to these plan amendments, but we wanted to give the opportunity to show as a total fund what all of our general revenue would go to. So it would either go to these land acquisition fund projects and, you know, with the including these two plan mergers, um, or we could, you know, we could have, instead of having a balance of $17.8 million when we did this analysis, we could have just said we have $16 million for this land acquisition fund and go to the, the board and the council in a separate action to fund our plan mergers from general revenue resources. Meaning that we're pooling all of our general revenue together in one place and giving you the opportunity to vet through each project and see if this is something that we want to do as a direction for an agency. Um, the plan mergers are vital because these both, both of these um, project areas and these regions have a lack of resources. Doing these plan amendments would hopefully, in, in the long term, create sustainable project areas where we don't have to do operation, operating subsidies from general revenue to support them. Okay. Um, Ms. Perry. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we're in an economic situation now where I think we're way past the need to, I guess, to choose the words pare down, cut back, and focus. Land acquisition was a vision approach. We have plenty of projects in the pipeline that we can focus on, and if we just get those projects done, I question whether we even needed a land acquisition fund in the first place, but I want to say up front, I have a lot of concerns about the redevelopment agency's report, and I appreciate the CAO report and the options presented today. Within the CRA report, there's approximately 18 million uh, in land acquisition funds being committed to projects for which we have no detailed background on, and it's unclear, uh, based on the way the report is written, whether these projects have been reviewed or approved or vetted by the land acquisition fund task force. So I don't understand why this item was even included in the mid-year carryover budget, and I ask that we adopt the CAO's recommendation requiring each project to come in separately for approval. I feel, and this is my opinion, that the redevelopment agency included the land acquisition fund uh, as an attempt for us to conceptually approve projects that have not been thoroughly vetted, and, and, and I'll just say this on the record, this is uh, an effort by management 
to pit one council office against another, particularly in South Los Angeles. Now, for me, I find that a very insulting tactic to other elected officials because that assumes that if you make a promise, a sidebar promise, to one elected official that their project will be taken care of, then uh, outside of a fully vetted process, then of course they're going to reject what another council office, in this case that would be me, would say today. Uh, and in my opinion, it's the most clumsy and unnecessary form of patronage politics uh, that I, I've seen in a while. So I think it, I would say and suggest that it stop. For the record, and the HCD report that goes to council, I want to make a motion moving the CAO report and instructing the redevelopment agency to provide separate board reports and acquire board and council approval on each potential land acquisition fund project. That's one. Additionally, I have recommend, concerns with recommendations two and three regarding central industrial and city center project areas within the Redevelopment Agency Board report. Now, some of you may recall that on May 15, 2007, the proposed settlement for the city center and the central industrial project was heard in closed session at my request. I had to intervene and work with our city attorney and ask the redevelopment agency to reject a proposed county settlement which would have yielded only 20 percent of the tax increment from the project areas and possibly still violate the Bernardi cap subjecting the matter to possible further litigation. My council colleagues supported my position unanimously. I instructed the city attorney to reject the settlement and appeal the decision. Now today, the city is reaping the benefits of the council's action. In fact, even the city's general fund benefited and the city was able to receive the funds the county had been impounding because the settlement took place. Now, according to the CRA board report, Central Industrial owes $1.6 million in general revenue and City Center owes $6 million. However, this is the first time in eight years that either project has been able to collect tax increment because of the lawsuit and establish work pro programs. So it, from, a, from a logic standpoint, it makes no sense to require repayment the first year out. I would also like to make a motion, I'll go over these again at the end, to remove any general revenue and or settlement proceed repayment obligations from central industrial and city center project areas for at least three years and dedicate all funds to the work programs that are already in the pipeline. I strongly recommend we adopt recommendation two in the CAO report. This is important to me. Now, you know, a lot of people, they either uh, say, majority of things about downtown or they don't understand downtown. But let's talk about downtown because it's a very unusual place. No other project areas in the city have been subjected to such intense litigation as city center and central industrial, nor has the council had to, had to intervene as much. Downtown is an unusual place. First, no other part of the city is subject to the Wiggins settlement and you'll recall the Jones settlement, a case uh, brought by the ACLU because of the number, the highest concentration of homeless people in the entire city here in downtown Los Angeles. And in both cases, both in Wiggins and in Jones, both of these settlements address the need for the creation of more permanent supportive housing. As a matter of fact, we are legally bound to fulfill the requirements of the settlement obligation by building a specific number of affordable housing units within a given timeline. That is part of the settlement language in both cases. Second, as many of you know, there is no other part of the city that has so many concentrated social service uses and single room occupancy hotels. There is no other part of the city that has this. So I believe we should be dedicating all of the general revenue and proceeds settlement from city center and central industrial to the rehabilitation of the single room occupancy hotels and into sustainable and uh, healthy uh, affordable housing options. Uh, so again, I'm going to reiterate, we adopt the recommendation to in the CAO report. And finally, I want to ask the redevelopment agency to report back to the committee on two items. In the city center work program, there is $75,000 allocated for industrial land use policy. Since there is no industrial land use policy uh, for which I can get any clarification, I don't understand why there is a hold 
uh, that approves that item within this budget. We haven't voted on an industrial land use policy. I suspect we are not going to reach any sort of consensus on that anytime soon. And uh, I don't see any reason to keep a hold on that money. Lastly, there is no reference to the state budget impact and how that's being handled from a redevelopment agency perspective. And I ask my colleagues to consider whether or not it is even prudent to approve a mid-year budget that does not address that issue also. So those are my comments. I have several, I think two motions contained therein and um, would like to put those on the record and ask if I can get a second if you would like. I can read them again, Mr. It's not second. Okay. You want me to read them again into the record? I think what we'll do is let's let uh, Mr. Cardenas has some questions that he wants to ask. Then when we're about ready to wrap okay. this up, we'll come back. Great. Okay. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the CRA, you mentioned uh, something about CRA policy a few minutes ago. Can you uh, state that again, what you were referring to? Um, well, there's a couple of policies at stake here, but um, the one policy that I was referring to was about how we pool all of our general revenue resources to create the land acquisition fund. Prior to the creation of the land acquisition fund, all the general revenue was kind of uh, at the discretion of the um, the CEO or, or at, called at one point in time the administrator. So, um, you know, we decided, the agency decided to pool the resources together to create this land acquisition fund so that, um, you know, catalytic critical projects could be made across the, all of, you know, the project areas that couldn't be made before because of all the pooled resources. Prior to that, it was, you know, discretionary and there was small amounts maybe in different project areas and things like that. Now, when you referred to that and you said agency policy, you're talking about agency practice or a policy that was a directive of the council that that shall be agency policy? Um, it was a practice that was then adopted as part of the land acquisition fund policy. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Carr? That's it. I was going to say a lot of stuff, but she already said it all. <laughs> so, it. You, can, you can add she in. She jumped. No, no, you, you did a fine job. Mr. Garcetti, did you want to say anything? Okay, so at, at this time, uh, Ms. Perry, yes. I will afford you the opportunity to mm -hmm. reiterate the motions and will okay. let you know in, in advance that um, I will support them, but you have to get nifty little jackets like that. For, uh, okay, you can get every, a nifty jacket. For, for every member of this committee. Yeah, no, you got to go over so the we, too. So that we can all come here one day and we'll all dress alike. So, every, so that's, that's, right, that's, that's the right. conditions of all my right. support. Well, you just have to take yourself over to the uh, uh, Los Angeles mission after council adjourns. No, you are the powerful help, leader from help. that area. And I think a phone call from you, and okay. we have four. All right, I'll see what I can do. Right, <laughs> shiny, white jacket. What size do you wear? Medium. Okay. And okay. get uh, large for Mr. Cardness okay. and uh, okay. a small for Mr. Gar <laughs> uh, uh, me a medium for Mr. Garcetti. All right, okay, okay. <laughs> Miss Perry. Okay, in, in, uh, in keeping with the hilarity of the moment, uh, number one, Stop the patronage politics. Have a second on that? Have a second on that, Mr. Cardenas? So, uh, no more patronage Thank politics. Yeah. Thank you. Number two. Yeah, okay. Stop it. Yeah. Number two. Uh, motion moving the CAO report, instructing the redevelopment agency to provide separate board reports and acquire board and council approval on each potential land acquisition fund project. Can I get a witness? Yes, I have a witness. Amen. All right. Motion number two, uh, remove any general revenue and or settlement proceed, proceeds repayment obligation from central industrial and city center project areas for at least three years and dedicate all funds to work programs. Witness? Thank, Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. Somebody's <laughs> going to start passing the collection. Yeah, pass the collection plate. Okay. That's it. Unless you want more. No, okay, no, then enough? without Thank objection. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so ordered. Mr. Okay. Uh, um, my understanding is that you also have some technical amendments, and those will be submitted. No, no, I'm, I'm not done yet. Okay. 
Right. That's, that's just, oh, that's just see, her. See, this, oh. this is your first day. You just have to get <laughs> used to it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm not gotcha. done yet. Okay, gotcha. so we uh, then where it relates to item 12, without objection, we'll adopt the, the uh, CAO report, the leading recommendation one, and adding uh, so the, uh, some additional amendments where it relates to AB 1290. So without objection, uh, Mr. CLA, uh, what's the next item? The next item is uh, item number 13, uh, LHD and CAO report relative to the 2009 Affordable Housing Trust Fund and permanent supportive housing program, uh, NOFA, and related actions. Okay, now I think I want to take public comment first on this. Chuck, what time do you get here? Why are you always the first card? Because you are, but Chuck, you're item 13, come on. The second one is, uh-oh, Andrew. Daniel Falcon and Nancy Lewis. And Molly Reisman. Just hold tight, Chuck. We'll let it calm down a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. And the answer to your question is I get my coffee and do my notes like you have your coffee. A uh, good morning. Every week, the housing department should report at this committee to keep the public informed of available funding, available projects, program notices of funding availability, and re related actions of the 2009 Affordable Housing Trust Fund. That they have actions, there are actions that relate to the people, and it should be in the interests of all the people in the city and the people that need help in affordable housing. And this money, having an accounting of what it's used for to help these people and keeping them update on what's going on. And, uh, uh, you know, it's to help people that need your help. And I, I would recommend that this committee introduce some kind of motion that a report be standard and made every week on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and how the money's used for programs that can help the people, the public, so they're aware of it if there's deficits, because people, it's a, it's a number one issue in this city is housing. And this fund is supposed to help people get housing. So people should know what's going on and what they're doing every single week and any projects that relate to it. So again, I recommend this committee introduce some kind of motion that a report be made every week on the Affordable House Housing Trust Fund and what it is used for for the people and any notices of funding availability and available projects that they're doing and that is available to the public. And I, I would hope they would do that. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Mr. Falcon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Or Mr. Chair. Uh, Daniel Falcone. Did you call me? Chair, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, the uh, current NOFA is, is, uh, is before you, and, and it comes to you in really, a, in, as all you all know, difficult times. And there's discussion uh, between member, many members of the affordable housing world uh, as to how the resources should be prioritized and where they should go. And it really forces, I think, the policy decision to come at a choice of goods. There's, you'll hear. I think several different voices today, all of which are good voices. There's not a right or wrong answer um, in the decision, um, but the, the situation of resources or the lack thereof really forces a, a decision. Uh, to put that in the context, you're really looking at about $7 million that can be spent citywide and about $14 million that can be allocated within CRA project areas. And at the end of the day, that's about five projects uh, in the entire city. Um, of those, um, three would be in the CRA areas and two citywide. And I say potentially three in the CRA because if for whatever reason nothing is submitted in a CRA area that gets, uh, meets the readiness criteria and award, uh, those dollars are typically accrued and saved for a future round. So you could end up with even less than the five projects um, as currently allocated. So it's a grim uh, allocation at best. And uh, I, so I come to you with, with, with that context. Um, Currently, also in the mix is the uncertainty at the 
uh, state level with a 9% tax credit allocation. Uh, there's currently a discussion as to canceling the first round, 9% uh, altogether, or if there is a first round, that it be a, a limited uh, round uh, and things get pushed back into the June area just to allow for some certainty and calmness to hopefully uh, come over the marketplace. So all of those things really lead to a very limited uh, options. Um, I would ask that you consider a couple things um, with that. One is to uh, look at doing uh, findings of benefits for the funding that comes from the CRA so that dollars can be spent citywide as opposed to only in project areas. It might allow a little more flexibility in allocation of projects. Um, maybe that should be with a nexus to uh, CRA areas of, of benefit, uh, maybe with city, uh, looking at city council boundaries to where the CRA areas are, um, so certainly the dollars don't flow too far away from those project areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lewis and uh, Ms. then Mr. Richmond. Uh, Frank, come on. You're the cleanup hitter at this juncture. Good morning, council members. My name is Nancy Lewis, and I'm speaking to you this morning on behalf of the Supportive Housing Alliance. We're a group, an advocacy group, of 10 developers of supportive housing. Together, we have developed about 6,800 units of housing in Los Angeles County, about half of which are supportive housing units. Um, we are concerned that the uh, uh, NOFA in front of you today prohibits projects serving the chronically homeless from applying for funds, um, which would also allow them to access project-based Section 8. These are essential funds to allowing us to proceed and gain access to state and other sources of funding for affordable housing. We recognize the limited number of funds available in the city and um, ask that in recognition of that, rather than prohibiting such projects from applying for funds until some later date, that the city amend its current NOFA and allow projects serving the chronically homeless and others that would be otherwise eligible under the permanent supportive housing NOFA to apply also under this NOFA so that we can compete equally with projects that would apply under the affordable housing NOFA and where permanent supportive housing projects awarded funds that we be able to access project-based Section 8. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Molly Reisman, Skid Row Housing Trust. I'm also here as a member of the Supportive Housing Alliance and asking you to consider the amendment that is in the Supportive Housing Alliance letter that was submitted. Again, I reiterate, all we are asking is to be able to compete. We understand that there's extreme, extremely limited resources. We're not asking for additional money. We're just asking for the opportunity to compete for the funds that are available. Skid Row Housing Trust has been developing permanent supportive housing for decades. We competed under the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for many years, and we were able to secure Affordable Housing Trust Fund dollars and build supportive housing before we had a supportive housing program. Even if one supportive housing development is funded because it's allowed to compete, that may build dozens of units for individuals who are homeless. Otherwise, we will have a glut of developments competing in the round of the supportive housing program that would occur in April of May or next year. All of us who are supportive housing developers have a number of projects. If we're not able to compete now, we have to hold on to those projects and there will be many competing and we will still have projects not funded in April. In, addi in addition to that, we do not know what the affordable housing funding environment will be in April. There's a lot of uncertainty now. We do not know if Prop 1C funds will be available. We do not know if our syndicators will be able to syndicate tax credits next summer. So if you ask us to hold on, we don't know what environment we're going to be going into. So again, I reiterate, we're simply asking to be able to compete. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fonseca. Frank Fonseca with American Communities. Uh, here on behalf of uh, support of the, the pending uh, transmittal, essentially uh, the, the most important thing uh, I think I can, I can convey is the housing trust fund used to be $100 million, uh, and it was broken into two rounds at $50 million each. This particular NOFA is only for $26 million. Uh, as everyone knows, we're having a crisis in, in the equity marketplace for affordable housing projects, which means it's more important than ever to leverage as many resources as possible. The Prop 1C transit-oriented development program is going to exhaust its funds in the upcoming year. Uh, Forty-five percent of the $95 million under that NOFA, state NOFA, will be available to Southern California cities. 
the city of Los Angeles needs every possible dollar it can allocate for family and senior affordable housing projects and TOD potential projects, or we're going to miss out on one of the biggest state subsidies um, that will be sunsetted forever after next year. So I urge uh, the council to consider all of the necessary leveraging sources that it takes to really bring and produce significant affordable housing units. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mercedes, and before you, uh, before you begin, uh, Ms. Perry is so concerned that I might uh, forget that she has something to say that I think, you know, because she says I'm old, I think she yeah. should uh, let her make her statement first and then. Yes. Oh, Miss Perry. That, well, I thought I'd write it down for you because <laughs> if you see it and you and you visualize it, no, no, but then it'll make be sure it's with real big letters. Wait, bold print over with a note. No, no, it's okay. It says, I want to speak. I'm being supportive of you. I'm saying, just tell me. Yeah, no, no. Because see, that way you visualize it. It is imprinted, and therefore I know you won't forget it. And. <laughs> This is a good thing. I realize permanent supportive housing, uh, the NOFA is coming out in April 2009, and I just wanted to make a motion asking LAHD to look at the following items, and I'll give you some notes on this later. Um, removal of negative point scoring for projects located in the Central City East slash Skid Row community. A reasonable unit size exemption for buildings that are declared historic cultural monuments. and. I think this is really important and a new way of looking at things because I'm thinking about what we could have done with Project 50, which is link people uh, to, from shelter to housing, and maybe we can do it this time. Providing a link between people who are staying in shelters in Los Angeles to the units that are being built by the Permanent Supportive Housing Program. And then finally, that's the motion. Um, May I have, thank you, have a second on that. And then finally, one report back request regarding the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I would like to ask Housing and the Redevelopment Agency to report back to this committee about using the 14 million in redevelopment funds on a citywide basis, and that is as opposed to constraining them or limiting them to the project area from which they were generated, and I think of one in particular, and I believe it's Mr. Zine's area, where they have a good sum of money that they're sitting on, but it's one of the areas where the leadership uh, is very resistant to building low-income and affordable housing. And if they don't want to do it, then maybe we need to find another way to use that money. And I say that without malice, uh, just it's a reality check, and maybe we just need to move on and stop, stop trying to beat a dead horse and just get this money, get this money out there to build housing. Uh, so again, as opposed to constraining them to the project area where they were generated from the money, I would like to make a motion asking LAHD and the Redevelopment Agency to report back to HCED about how we could accomplish the goal of basically releasing the money from the redevelopment areas where people are not spending their, their tax increment on building affordable housing so that we can get going in the areas where we are willing to do it and to move it over into those areas and to tell us if that is even possible and if so, how we can do it. Thank you. In fact, just on top of that, realistically, how, how long would it take for you to do that assessment and come <coughs> back? Because I'd like to kind of put a time on it because it's in, how long would it take you to do that? Well, uh, I'm not the redevelopment agency and well, what under, realistically then how my, long do you My think? understanding of this is it, it's a matter of policy, right? As a matter of law, the tw money that is set aside, the 20 percent that is required from tax increment to be spent on housing, if, if the Redevelopment Com Agency Commission makes findings, the money can be spent all over the city where there is a need. So it is an issue really of working through the Redevelopment Agency and I imagine with the Mayor's Office of coming to a, a discussion and a decision about the use of that money from a policy point of view. Uh, and so that is not something that I could even begin to give you a, a timeline on. Okay, well then this is what, what we want to do here. Uh, I would like to get this report, you know, in a real, I, we don't want to wait nine months. In, end of January? What? 
I don't know what's realistic. It sounds like what she's saying is we, we can, the agency can take an action on it now, uh, if she's correct. Uh, okay. You know, we can have at it now. But, but you know what, this is what I think we'll do. We'll pass uh, Ms. Perry's motion, and then I will uh, communicate directly with the agency to check on the timeline, okay. keep you approved, uh, apprised, and we'll try to move it uh, quickly. But point, of, point, point of clarification, um, um, to Mercedes, you, you said a matter of law, 20% on housing. Now that's a minimum of 20%, up to 20%. It is a minimum. In other cities, for instance, San Francisco and San Jose, who have done robust housing programs, they've used up to 50% of their tax increment for housing. It is a matter of, of policy. The law requires a minimum of 20%, but it can, you could use it all if you wanted to. I mean, that's a mass, those are issues of policy. A minimum of 20%. And in the city, we actually use 25%. 20% is within the, within the redevelopment agency, and 5%, an additional 5%, the city council years ago passed, comes to the, the trust fund. The $14 million that the councilwoman is speaking about is that five extra 5% that sits in the trust fund but can only be used if a deal comes <coughs> forward that fits it. And so what, I, what, I'm, what I'm assuming that the councilwoman is asking is that findings be made on that 5% that is already in the trust fund, not any other money. Again, uh, the, those numbers are a minimum of 20, Correct. a minimum of 5, for a minimum of 25%. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Garcetti. Um, and then we, we are going to afford you the opportunity to do your presentation. Thank you, Be sir. assured of that. <laughs> oh, I, I can wait till after the presentation. That's really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Now, I have a quick question. Sure. <laughs> you heard some of the... Uh, the individuals that spoke on this item. Do you have, you know, quick response to I some do. of the things? I do. Yes. Uh, as all of them said, uh, we are in a difficult time. But we are not just in a difficult time because of the budget situation, because of the credit markets. It is true that there is a drastic decline in credit equity in the markets. It is true that, as we have seen earlier today, um, there was a motion to put more money into a deal because of some of those problems. It is, it is our clear belief that we have spent the last two months shoring up deals that already had all of their funding in place, right? And through no fault of their own, because of the credit markets, the tax equity partner fell out. We have had to come back and we have to figure that out. My clear view is if we as a city are going to go forward and continue in the business of affordable housing, we have to understand that we're in a time like this. Our first obligation is to make whole the deals that have already been funded. We have to keep them through the pipeline. So that requires money that has to be, we have to have money available to solve problems that through no fault of their own are created because of the financial crisis we have. That's one thing. Secondly, because of this process, we also have a, a drastically lower amount of paybacks of home dollars, right? So program income is down. Um, because of this crisis. So nobody is paying back, right? It's very difficult. So we have even lower money, you know, even lower funding coming through. But it is also true that when you have a housing policy and all of you have appropriately and, and with great levels of articulation and passion over the years talked about the need to have a housing policy, that we understand what it is we're trying to fund. Well, once we lay that out, as we have in the trust fund, right, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, through you and the mayor's office, has set aside our funding to try to achieve two goals and to keep them in balance. The creation of permanent supportive housing for the chronically homeless and the regular program of affordable housing for families and seniors and others with needs. So it is a dual parallel goal that we have to do. And as all of the speakers have said, we have less funding. You all know that, right? That when I first arrived, you all know that we did Project Clean House and we were able to turn around somewhere in the area of over $50 million in capital and we have used it. Well, LHD, I'm, I'm you know, pleased to say we've done a good job. We have gotten all that money out. There's no money sitting, right? We're a good bank. And as a result of that and lower income coming, right? We had general fund cut to the trust fund last year. 
uh, and we've had federal dollars cut every year, right? So there's, we're nowhere close to $100 million now of equity. All right. Having said that, my job is to come to you and balance those needs of permanent supportive housing and our regular affordable housing program in the best way that we can. And we do that taking into account what's going on with tax credits, what's going on with other leveraging sources, as others have said, right? Um, what's going on in the state competitions, and where we are on our goals. Now, the permanent supportive housing developers, and I am glad to see the Supportive Housing Alliance. I will tell you honestly that in a meeting with them a year and a half ago, I asked them to form the alliance <laughs> so that we could speak um, all together. So they've done that, and I'm pleased about it. So you should know the housing department supports it. It was our idea that they do it. But this is what's, this is what's happened as we manage these two goals. Since 2006, mid-2006, right, because the program for permanent supportive housing was adopted not in the beginning of the year and got rolling later, we have funded 793 permanent supportive housing units, right? Last year, uh, we actually funded 294. When all the funding commitments were done, because we had carryover from 2007, we actually funded 519 units last year. Let me tell you a little bit about how people have done in competition, and this will tell you how we balance the other goals. In 2006, we received five applications for permanent supportive housing. We funded five. A hundred percent of them were funded. In 2007, we received six applications, and we funded four, so 67 percent. In 2008, we received four applications, and we funded three. That's 75 percent. But I will tell you, that we have funded 100% of every deal that was actually ready. Now that has led to a false sense of security, and I understand why, on behalf of the permanent supportive housing developers, right? Because they've been able to get them through, and we've had the money, right? And we've had the vouchers as a startup. Now let me tell you what the picture looks like on the other side of the house for the developers that are doing family housing. In 2008, through the two rounds, we received 56 applications. We were able to fund 15. So in the second round, right, so break that down. In the second round, we received 31 applications. We were able to fund six. That means we were only able to fund 19%. You understand the, the problem. That means we're also down as we're tracking on the number of units. It's my job to keep them in balance. And while I know this is enormously difficult, it is difficult for us. No one likes to say no, particularly for a business that is doing so well, right? But I have to deal with what I've got. My concern is this. If we don't hold the balance where we are now, the message that we are sending our family developers is that the chances of winning an allocation and then ultimately a state tax credit allocation is so small that it doesn't start to pencil out that they should be in this business with us. Now we have worked, all of us, have worked incredibly hard to build that business. The New Generation Fund is in place to help get that moving, right? We have Prop 1C, we all fought incredibly hard to make sure that Prop 1C met the goals of Los Angeles. One of the speakers was correct. The last round of Prop 1C is probably this next round. If we take money out of it, by opening up, right? When we say, when permanent supportive houses say, let's open it up, they are saying take money away from the other. Let's be honest, okay? They are saying that. But we are putting then the family houses who already have just a 20% or 19% chance of winning even less opportunity to get the leverage on Prop 1C. We have to constantly weigh. The other thing is that permanent supportive housing deals have a better chance with a 4% tax credit deal on our MHP. Right? They have another opportunity outside of the tax credit, 9% tax credit program. The tax credit program itself only has enough commitments to fund four permanent supportive housing deals in the entire state. Only four. So we're constantly looking at how is it that we're going to do this. We believe this is the most prudent course of action. Even though difficult, right? we believe this is what we have to do. In April, when the federal dollars come in, we will have a, a, a robust round for permanent supportive housing. Everyone is in the same danger. Permanent supportive housing deals are no greater danger given the market and tax credits than anybody else. And while I know this is difficult for, for all of us, 
I am, I am telling you that we have looked at every, at every angle. And you know that we have been incredibly successful in our, in our, you know, in our doing our analysis of what will win. We think that this is the best way to go. And we ask you to support us. Now, if we get somewhere on this 14 million of that's in the CRA, that's currently in the 5% pool. I'm not, you know, we're not talking about anything else. What's there? That will give the, re that will give the housing department the opportunity to come back to you and say, all right, if we had some, some movement on that 14 million, that, that money under the MOU we have with the CRA stays within the regular affordable housing pool. But it would permit the housing department to come back to you and recommend moving some home dollars from that pool into permanent supportive housing to help bolster that. So that's what would happen. We would end up moving dollars from the regular fund to permanent supportive housing because we would have uh, an, an, you know, some more flexibility on the 14 million. That's what ended up happening. Now, we're in a t very tough, tough year, and I am told by the mayor's office really that I shouldn't expect any general fund at all. So, we're, you know, it's just a, an incredibly tough year. And this is where we are. For a question on that point, she's in our, on that uh, point. Just on this point, um, for example, okay, here's an idea. If we amended this, the uh, memorandum of understanding between LAHD and the redevelopment agency, would that be a quick and direct way to make the 5% available on a citywide basis? And is, is that a viable option? If the MOU were amended, I'd have to take a look to see what else it, uh, Im what else it impacts. Um, but what I would do is rather than doing it citywide, we would come back to you with recommendation. The problem is this. If we don't have enough money in either fund, you can't fund. Right now, the capital that is, in, that is left over from permanent supportive housing, because we met our goals last year, right? There's less money there now because we did a good job, right? There's only enough money right now to fund 30% of one average deal. That is why we're recommending move it over to the regular program as a loan, since you can't do a deal there, so that we could fund at least two deals with the unrestricted capital. So if you were to amend it, we'd have to come back and see how it fits okay. to make money available. But we would be happy to come back and do that announcement. We've got to come back with a report anyway, so yes. we can add that onto the yep. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had a similar experience to Mr. Cardenas um, with Ms. Perry's earlier questions, um, which covered most of my stuff. So it must be the white coat. <laughs> and thank you for that, Ms. Perry. But I just wanted to, to uh, also add my uh, support for that motion and reporting back on that. And just to go a little further with the logic as to why we have a, a huge economic downturn, particularly in the housing sector. We need jobs, we need housing more than we did a year ago, more than we did two years ago. We also have coupled with that the state looking at the one source of funds they can take, which is CRA dollars. And we just, if we want to play defense on those funds, we have to spend them out quickly. If we want to play offense on housing, we need to build housing. So it seems very clear that that report should be back in Swift's time, and I think the city attorney should assist in looking at what options. Does it have to go through the board? Is there a way that we can find um, some sort of finding a benefit um, in an, an emergency way? Um, I think clearly if there's ever a, um, a time to be able to find some larger benefit to our redevelopment areas, if there's some projects that are within the blocks, we live in a single housing market, and certainly the people who will be moving into those um, affordable housing areas live primarily in project areas. So I think there is a nexus there. I also um, wanted to ask, when you said the 793 units, 92, what is it? 93. 93. Um, how many in that same time period have we built that are not permanent supportive housing units? Oh. In, give it right. It's in the area of a little over 1,800. Okay. Uh, but that means that we're down um, somewhere in the area of 800 units off okay. of our mark. Off the what? Off, off the mark. Off the mark of the goal was about 2,600 right. of non-permanent non supportive housing stuff. And, and that's primarily due to rising construction costs, land prices, right. what is it? it? It's due to all the things you cite, and, but it's largely due to the less to in the affordable less capital. housing trust fund. Um, this underscores two other things. One, our housing policy, which we helped develop in this committee, um, 
And you know, those goals, we, we did try at one, one point with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to really say 10% has to go here to home ownership and 20% has to be there. And it's tough to hit those goals precisely. And I think it's limited to do that. We had uh, an unbundling of that so that we could have some flexibility. Um, and I think that that's good. The, the second piece though, uh, is the permanent needed for a permanent source of funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund just is continue to be underscored. Um, and I was worried that we had uh, in the mayor's budget a, a lower allocation this year um, for our housing trust fund. Um, this is a, a rough year to suddenly go back to the budget and try to find that permanent source of funding. Um, but even putting in place something for future growth years, just as we're doing with mixed income right now, nobody thinks that mixed income is going to be a great boon to the uh, uh, stimulus of building housing at this moment, but it's a good time to do it because when the economy recovers, it'll be in place. Similarly, I would say even more important is the permanent funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chair, on that and seeing what we can do um, to either take that back to the people in some way or to figure that out in here in, in house as well. Last thing is um, I hear loud and clear the permanent supportive housing folks' uh, words and it's, it's just the, the saddest of times that we're turning, you know, homeless folks uh, in, in essence, not that you're doing this, but that we are turning homeless folks against seniors, against poor folks. I mean, it's like, you know, let's, let's get all those who are in the greatest need to, to fight with one another about where the funding is. As long as we have, ta I think with the PSH program, as long as we have put that as something separate and really elevated it up, we can either merge everything together, and I'd be open to that if the Alliance wanted to do that, or we should keep them separate. Um, but to do both is a little bit of a, of a double dip. And I know that's tough from where people are sitting because you're doing probably the most um, um, heart-wrenching housing construction for those who are in many ways at the bottom of the, the ladder. But let's work on other places, and I think the best place to start really is in that CRA money and to take a portion of that potentially to go into um, a new round for PSH as well as uh, to help us with regular housing. May I ask a clarifying question? Oh. Councilwoman, I may have misheard you. Were you saying that, in response to your last comment, that what, what you were interested in in the report back is having CRA make findings every year on the 5% if we amend the MOU? Uh, no, I was asking, on the very last point that I made, I was asking whether or not, whether we, if we amended the MOU between housing and CRA, whether that would be a way to make the 5% available citywide, and then you wanted to weigh the, I guess, the pros and cons of that. And so, you know, whatever. All right. I just yeah. want to make sure I understand. I understand. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Cardenas. Um, now, for this round, um, you'd like to make some of the criteria is that you include bonus points for projects located close to bus hubs in agreement with Proposition 1C transit oriented development guidelines, correct? For this round only? Um, the, the NOFA would give. Prior, a, a subsidy boost of projects near transit stations. Now, there, uh, the state defines transit stations, including includes bus hubs. That's anywhere over three. Yeah, years. but let's cut to the chase. Right. If you're we, next we, to we, a real transit station, right. you get yes. maximum points. If you're next yeah. to a little bus hub, they throw you a, a penny or two, which isn't going to get you uh, well, we, the points you need to, to win. Right. We agree with that. And the reason for that this year is because of what's left in the Prop 1C money. When, that, when we suck up as much of that, you will... You know, our priorities change and shift as we're looking at where the money is and how we take advantage of it. So for this year, there's probably just one more round of Prop 1C, and we want to make sure that we're getting that money. Yeah, but we have to be honest with ourselves and realize that those are state guidelines that where you have heavy rail, uh, you get the maximum points. Yes, and, and I disagree with what the state did, but you're right. When you're by the orange line and when you're by, you know, corridors like Van Nuys Boulevard or what have you, uh, and you have a lot of traffic, the fact that it's not heavy rail means that you're going to get a little bit of points and you're not going to get the maximum potential points. That is and true. isn't it the case that uh, in some rounds it tends to be only those projects that get the maximum points across the board that actually get funded? That is true. I mean, that's the way the game is played. I mean, you know, for, for a developer to say, wow, I got 92% of points, and they have a smile on their face, real developers who know the game laugh at them and say, unless you got 100, buddy, you're not in the game. So my point is, for, before the game even starts, if, you, if you're able to get the maximum number of points because of the transportation element, and you're only able to get a modicum of points in that category because you just don't have that element near you, you're kind of out of the game before you start. 
Well, it's yes, and it's because you're already it's not your out of fault, Mercedes. no, no, no. I'm but it's because you're already out, out of the game, game for Prop One C, right? I mean, yeah, but the thing is, what you, I need you to to help me understand, since I represent a community that needs a lot of housing, but at the same time, my community does poorly with Prop One C. I mean, we're just not going to get any Prop One C money because we're out of the game before we start. Now, explain to me why we would want to once again put communities like mine at a disadvantage on another process, this particular process. Because we already gave up on Prop 1C, right, in my district. Because I, I don't have the red line near my district. That's it's right. Not, it, it doesn't cover a radius and doesn't touch my district. So all of the projects in my district, they wasted their time trying to apply for Prop 1C in my district. Now, on this one, if you're going to be uh, giving people bonus points that projects in my district can't get bonus points for, why should I be for this? I guess I would put it this way. To the degree that we are able to put those deals in a position to leverage more state dollars, it ends up helping the local pot in the end. Now, you're aware that last year we did something similar. And when, when the deals fell out, um, we were able to fund a deal in your district. Um, because we were able to take advantage of the other pots of money. But, but, so that's, I, and I appreciate your, your reminding me and your honesty because basically with this being in this NOFA round, if for some reason somebody falls out, then a project in my district could be on the Plan B list, not the Plan A list. There's no question that as well we have a finance system that uh, favors all of the different leveraging pools, that for that particular leverage, that's true. It is also true, Councilman, that because of our concern, particularly in the Valley, actually this was even before Prop 1C, what we have done is we changed the rules so that we give more money to deals that are outside of the uh, city of industry boundaries. Because what we found when I first arrived is that almost no Valley deals were being funded because we had a requirement in the competition that, that um, all developers had to go for, for the city of industry dollars, but we didn't make up any difference for people who could not be eligible. Yeah. So in your district, we actually are, will give money up to the entire amount of city and industry to try to balance it out. And that has led in the last three years to many more deals in the Valley being funded because actually the competition gives more money, is eligible to Valley deals because they're ineligible for city of industry dollars. So we have tried to balance it out and we've been pretty successful in it. But you are right, on this particular point, you're at a disadvantage. You do know, I know that you know, that we fought hard against that hard rail definition, that I think it prejudices LA in many, many ways and that Van Nuys Boulevard is one of the particular places that could really use a makeover, right? And, and we need the kind of funding that we've been able to use, particularly I'd say Councilwoman in Central Avenue, where we have funded so many deals and it's having a huge impact on that, on that boulevard. The same thing is needed for Van Nuys. Um, I would say to you that what, we, what this is t showing to us, and we're, you know we're happy to work with you whenever you want. We need to go to Sacramento all together and we need to lay out these priorities differently. I fought my heart out to get that definition changed. And what we were able to do was at least move them from a quarter mile to half a mile because even the, even the deals on the hard rail, the red line, weren't going to qualify mm -hmm. under the definition that the state put out that was in a complete, a complete bow to Northern California and the BART system. Yeah, mm -hmm. San Francisco was the big, the big Well, one. not really San Francisco, try Oakland. <laughs> Bay Area. Was the pro tem Parada. back then from Oakland? Yes, Oakland? Mr. Parada. Yep. But we had a speaker from L.A. Oh, well. Hey, you I'm not saying about all speakers from L.A. I'm just saying that one slipped by. You win some, you lose some. Okay. No more questions. Then uh, without objection, we'll adopt this. Uh, there, uh, there's some technical amendments, and those will be provided to the clerk. Okay. So without objection, we'll adopt the CAO report with the Housing Department's amendments. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, okay, we'll test the city uh, attorney right now. Mr. City Attorney, oh, uh, you had one more I'm thing? I'm sorry. I was just made aware of something, Mr. Cardenas, uh, that's good news. The state has proposed a change of awarding not less than 40% of the funds to projects served by a qualifying transit station not served by heavy rail. 
yesterday. Good. So we might we might get there. I'm happier. It's just in. Yeah, just Real, just just news in. flash. Last night, Mr. S Mr. City Attorney, is there any more business before this committee? M Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry uh, that that prompted another question. So, the concerns that I express for areas that don't have heavy rail. So, your your. Our criteria. rules are if this happens. Your bonus criteria actually it, actually supports, gives greater opportunity for my district in the long run. Correct. To hopefully get, be successful in the NOFA and then also leverage Prop 1C funds. Correct. Whereas before yesterday, there wasn't that likely that they were going to be able to take advantage of both. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. City Attorney, is there any more business before this committee? You have completed all items on the agenda. There is no more business. Then this committee is adjourned. Thank you, sir.